part of our ministry because we do a lot of different variety of things and I, I see each person have a different gift you know to give and when we put it all together it's just a really good ministry and I can't brag on them enough and um, but we do have in reach and outreach in our class and um, the in reach is a refueling of our spirit you know and that's why we have a Bible book study. And uh, right now we're studying, I just started this book, and it's uh, by Dr. Robert Jeffries, and it's a place called Heaven, Ten Surprising Truths About Your Eternal Home. And um, it was, made me think about that C.S. Lewis quote that says, um, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in, but aim at earth and you get neither so our focus I think you know in this learning ground is to get as much of God in us you know that when we leave here we're taking that with us you know it's not going to be left and um, it is ministered to all of our hearts you know just the best is yet to come like that lady that was buried with a fork in her hand she was like the dinners but she wanted to be buried with a fork because she knew the best was coming you know so I think that's what we need to strive for is to focus on that and learn you know and teach others in the same process but we have to do that by feeding on his word and um, let's see our group also participates in outreach and uh we do a lot of local missions, like we were talking about taking the food, and also uh, we do meals for bereavement, and um, we send cards to encourage and uh, uplift, and and uh, just a word of God that could help somebody through a tough time. And um, Carolyn's already talked about the meals that we serve and we also prepare fruit baskets and you know we put a, a track or a some word of God in the fruit but we take those to the nursing home and to a lot of people not even that go to our church and there are ladies in our group that aren't members of this church they're members of another church so if you know anybody that would like to come they don't have to be members of anything you know to come it's a open class and uh, we have funded Bibles and books and hygiene products for the ladies in the jail and we've done diapers for inmates children and also clothes and uh, which all of this truly blesses our heart we uh, also do a Christmas gifts for a uh, needy family at Christmas and uh, we contribute with recess snacks to Miss Kay and her class at Pin Oak and uh, we've got a lot more plans in the future so if y'all need anything from our church you know to that we could do we're going to the nursing home today I'm looking back there at Eddie Coleman and just got a sample of what music we we have at the nursing home and that's part of our ministry too we take little treats to the residents there and believe me they do not need a hymnal we sing those songs and they know every word and turn their head up toward God and, and it's just praise is coming from those little individuals that might not even be able to say anything but they can sing the words that they've heard all their life and it blesses us when we go this discipleship ship uh, began around 2005 with five or six people that we've been meeting for 13 years now and I'm so glad that God has blessed it it's grown and it's become um, such a ministry that you know I guess um, we feel really blessed but we do have lots of room for others and uh, I think you, if you just try us out one Tuesday the reason we started at 12 o'clock was because we were hoping that some of the workers could take their lunch hour and come and 
you know, we, we have something cooked for you if y'all want to come. <laughs> we'll just, just divide the word of God and break bread. But I thank you and thank you, church. But most of all, I thank God for his power among us and to love him and love one another. Thank you. Again, we're doing some great stuff here at Rock Hill, and uh, just wanted y'all to be aware of all the things that are going on. You know, God calls us to make a difference in the world, and we have, uh, through our ministries, we're making a difference. And uh, sometimes it doesn't always translate to people in the pews, but, uh, you know, we are touching a lot of people's lives uh, in God's kingdom, which is what God calls us to do. If you have the Lord's Word, if you'll turn with me to Isaiah, and I can, while you're turning to Isaiah, I can vouch for these ladies know how to cook so just they actually let me sometimes eat with them so but if you'll turn with me to Isaiah chapter 28 Isaiah the prophet had on an impossible task when God called him to go preach you remember Isaiah has this great vision where he sees the Lord high and lifted up and his train is filling the temple and uh, he hears God saying, Who shall we send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, Here am I, Lord, send me. But we don't always cover the rest of what God told Isaiah. Basically, Isaiah's calling was to go and to preach the word of God until the cities were all desolate and God's people were destroyed. Now, how would you like that ministry? You know, most preachers I know want to at least see some success, but Isaiah was told up front that it was not going to be such because God's hope was, of course, that the people would listen to the prophet. But reality was they didn't. And once again, we see Isaiah bringing a message from the Lord to the leaders of the nation and them not heeding what God said. But let's read together. In, in the first part of chapter 28, God has addressed the leaders of the northern kingdom. By this time, the kingdom is divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the words that we read in verse 14 is when Isaiah turns his attention away from the nation of Israel and turns to the southern kingdom, which is called Judah. So let's read together in verse 14. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, who rule this people in Jerusalem. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol we have an agreement when our overwhelming whip passes through it will not come to us for we have made lies our refuge in falsehood we have taken shelter but look what God says therefore thus says the Lord God Behold, I am the one who is laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. Whoever believes in me will not be in haste, and I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line, and hell will sweep away the refuge of lies, and waters will overwhelm the shelter then your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we look at these words from your prophet to a nation and a leaders who refuse to listen to your words. Father, I pray that you would help us to take a look at our lives, where we are personally, but also where we are as a nation. Lord, I pray that it would call us to be more fervent in our prayers and more fervent in our dedication to you. Lord, may your perfect work be done in this place today. Lord, I pray it and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Leaning Tower of Pisa was in danger of falling. Maybe it's due to the fact, if you really think about it, the word pizza in Italian really means marshes, land of marshes. 
So you can imagine constructing a building on marshes. Another problem with the Leaning Tower Pizza is the foundation is only 10 feet deep and the building is 179 feet tall. Well, engineers finally decided it was going to fall if they didn't do something. And so they uh, decided back in, night, in the late 1980s they were going to have to do something to firm up the foundation so the building wouldn't fall over. And so for literally about 11 years, they worked to shore up the foundation so that the building would be stronger and not fall. The only problem is it's still about 12 feet out of plumb. Now, those of you who are carpenters know what a plumb line is. Some of you may not know. Sometimes you've seen them. They look like little air. A lot of them look like little air points that a really brass kind of weight or whatever is tied to a string. And a long time ago, before you had such thing as laser uh, levelers, you had a plumb line, and you would hold that plumb line up, and you could tell if the if a wall or a, a board or whatever was in plumb, or if it was in line like it needed to be. And so it wouldn't be leaning. So the building, the Leaning Tower Pizza, is still, even after the foundations have been shored up, it is still about 12 feet out of plumb. A building's foundation is of utmost importance. And the same is true of any society. As we celebrate the founding of this country later this week, we need to think about uh, the foundations on which our nation was formed if the foundations are not strong, the nation will crumble. We live in a day and time when people's lives are out of plumb, aren't they? We, we have morals that are almost non-existent. Uh, people's lives are literally falling into ruin. Relationships are crumbling. Families are crumbling. Uh, morals are in shambles. And we've gotten to a point in our nation where we don't even know how to blush at sin any longer. You know, Jeremiah accused God's people of that. We don't even, even blush at sin anymore. Stuff that we used to not even talk about in public places is now freely shown on television. I and mean, it doesn't seem to even bother us anymore. I, I want you to know I was shocked as I did some research for this message this week. And I hope this breaks your heart as much. I almost didn't share it, but I feel like it's need, especially for our parents of our children. But, you know, the Bible talks about the only God-approved relationship, sexual relationship, is within the bounds of marriage between a man and a woman. Anything else... Outside of that, dishonors God. Anything outside of that is sin. We are, we are dealing with a major problem in our country right now, the problem of pornography. And I, I hope and pray that you're not addicted to that. But let me share with you what is going on in our society today. And parents, I hope you'll take notice, especially you. Barna Research Group, which is one of the major research groups in 2017, so this is just last year we, that they did this study, they found that, that 11, only 11% 11 of teens, teenagers, and 5% of young adults, which would be in their 20s, probably non-married, they didn't say that, but 11% of teens and 5% of young adults don't see viewing pornography as bad. Sexting, which if you don't know what that is, there's no sense of you not knowing, but basically sexting is sending a text with a nude picture of yourself to somebody else. 62% of teens, almost two-thirds, and young adults have received a nude image from somebody Parents, do not let your kids have a phone and not pay attention to what they're doing. You have the responsibility to invade their privacy. I know they pitch a fit when you want their phones, but hey, you're a parent. And God has given you the responsibility of raising your children right. 62% of teens say they've received a nude image, and 40% of them reported that they had sent a nude image to a boyfriend or girlfriend. Guys, that is just one evidence. I could stand up here and start quoting statistics and start talking to you about stuff that 
Some of you as, as senior adults, especially even older than I am, I'm not a young chicken, but some of you here older than I am, you didn't even talk about relationships outside the family. You didn't even talk about sex. You didn't even talk about anything in public. I remember when I was growing up, you just didn't talk about stuff like that. Now you can read it on the news and see it on the television every day, all day long. Is there any wonder that families are crumbling to pieces when we can't even blush at sin any longer? Why are so many lives being ruined? Well, why does it seem the world's coming apart at the seams? God's Word clearly reveals the reason. Any one of us can know the truth. The truth is in this book right here. It's in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and what God has put in this book right here. But we live in a day and time when people see the truth as being something relative rather than something that is known in absolute Many Americans, 56% according to Barna, and 64% of millennials, those who've been born since the year 2000, 64% don't feel that any one religious text has a monopoly on the truth. They believe that all different religions and all different books uh, have some kind of different expression of the same spiritual message. It's for that reason that a lot of people won't come to church anymore and listen to what God's Word has to say. They just look for religion and spirituality and whatever they can find. But God's Word tells us this book is truth. And so if we refuse to found our lives and we refuse as the leaders of this country, if we refuse to found this nation on the principles in this book... Things are going to crumble. Isaiah faced a similar issue with the people of his day and time. The prophet in Isaiah chapter 1 noted how much care and concern God had taken for his people. He had loved them. He had, he had defeated their enemies. He would given them a land. God cared and nourished his family. But God's people rebelled against him. The northern kingdom, as it says up in the first part of this chapter, was, was set, set like a, a literally a crown uh, or a wreath at the head of a fruitful valley. But the arrogance of her leaders was going to bring about her destruction. The people and the rulers of Samaria thought their fortress city was impregnable and that they would never face harm. Isaiah confronted this sinful nation with the Word of God. Guys, God's Word is always timeless. This Word that was written so many years ago still has value and importance for us today. What can we learn from God's Word spoken here by the prophet? I want to notice just two things real quick. First of all, notice how the condition of the nation as described by Isaiah Isaiah said that you're a bunch of scoffers. That's what he says right here in verse 18, or verse 14 and 15. Uh, you, you, you are scoffers. You rule this people in Jerusalem. Scoffers. They ridiculed Isaiah. They ridiculed the message from God. Uh, they literally were drunkards. If you look up in verses 9 and 10, they were drunkards who refused to hear God's voice and discern His judgment. For that reason, the nation was going to perish. They said to themselves, if you look down here, and I know Kay Arthur and some others use this verse of Scripture. In verse 10 it says, it's precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And if you look at that in Hebrew, it's like baby talk. That's what it sounds like in Hebrew. If you look at the words in Hebrew, it sounds like baby talk. And basically, the rulers of this nation were saying, Isaiah, you're treating us like children. We want to make up our own mind. We want to make our own decisions. We don't want to hear what you have to say to us. We don't want to hear God's message. And God's answer to them, a little bit before we read this passage of Scripture, if you don't listen to the words of my prophet, then you're going to listen to the foreign nation in a foreign tongue tell you the same thing. And as it says here, you're literally going to be broken and snared and taken in verse 13. These leaders wanted nothing to do with God's will for that nation. 
their scoffing and their mockery of God would cost them dearly. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about scoffers. For example, in Proverbs 28, 8, scoffers set a city aflame, but the wise turn away wrath. Another verse says, a wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not li listen to rebuke. In Proverbs 21, 24, scoffer is the name of the arrogant, haughty man who acts with arrogant pride. Boy, that is an apt description for the leadership of that country, the leadership of northern kingdom, uh, of the northern kingdom. And then on top of that, Isaiah, as we look in this passage of Scripture right here, addresses those who were leading the southern kingdom. And they literally had become idolaters. They had made a covenant with death. And really most probable this refers to an agreement or arrangement they had made with Egypt so that Assyria would not destroy the southern kingdom. They made a covenant with a nation who worshipped death. In other words, they were putting their hope and trust in idols rather than putting their hope and trust in God. Guys, to trust in idols is futile because idols do not exist. There's no life in them. There's no breath in them. They can't act. There's no power in them because they're made up conceptions of human beings. They are not God's. Somebody writing about this a particular passage says, Politically, Israel is turning its back on Yahweh, the life-giving God, to submit to someone who not only worships death deities, but whose submission to them renders Israel's own national existence as dead. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the way of death. That's exactly where the leaders of that particular nation had taken Israel, the northern kingdom, and also Judah, the southern kingdom. And before we're so quick to judge those leaders in that nation, we need to ask ourselves a question. How can we, as the United States of America, who have been so enlightened and so in favor of God, become so indifferent to him. We live in a day and time when people want to remove any reference to God in any of our textbooks or any of our history books. We live in a day and time when people want to destroy statues and remove them because they think they can change history. Guys, it's never going to change history. History is what it is. We can learn from the, the good parts of history and we can learn from the mistakes of history, but we can't change history. But there are people today that are so hateful and so scoffing at God that all they really want to do is to take God or any reference of him out of any document that has ever been founded and never been written in this nation. We have become a nation of scoffers who have no room for God and his wisdom. But if you want to understand, and I talked about the foundation you want to understand the foundation of this nation? Let me just read a couple of quotes from some of the founding fathers of our nation. And it'll make it clear how this nation was founded. Listen to what George Washington has to say. Father of our country. The propitious or the benevolent smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. In other words, George Washington says, if we ignore this book right here, we can't expect God's blessings on our nation. We can't expect God to bless us if we don't live by God's eternal rules, which are written in this book. Patrick Henry, y'all remember the one, if y'all studied anything about history, some of you young folks know, Patrick Henry said, is the one who said, give me liberty or give me death. But he also said this, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might not know how this nation was formed, but there was an upheaval when Martin Luther nailed 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church, wanting to debate the bishops on the right way of doing things and the wrong way of doing things. There were some issues in the Roman Catholic Church that needed to be addressed. 
And the church refused to address them. And so finally it came to a point in time in the 1600s when there were those inside the church who wanted to purify the church. I'm giving you a really quick history lesson because I could spend a few hours talking about this. But you had these guys called Puritans who wanted to purify the church, the Church of England and the Roman Catholic Church. But because the leadership of the church refused to listen, they finally decided it was no use. They were going to have to, to go a different way. And so they began to start different groups. Baptists were one of those groups that started. But those people faced intense persecution from the religious authorities of the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of England. And so many of those, because they were moved and their conscience by the Holy Spirit of the living God, wanted to worship God in a place where they wouldn't be punished for worshiping God like they wanted to. And so many of them came to the United States and formed colonies, which later would become states, which later the nation that we now enjoy. It were Christians who came to this country and founded a nation where they would be free to worship God as their heart dictated. That's where we are. And that's why Patrick Henry said it's not founded by religionists because religionists were those people like the Roman Catholics and the Church of England who wanted to dictate to everybody the way they ought to worship God. And he says it was founded by Christians. Benjamin Franklin, who was at the first uh, Continental Congress or the Con Constitutional Convention. He was interviewed about that one time, and this is what he said. In the beginning of our contest with Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sirs, were heard, and they were graciously answered. He goes on to say to that reporter, I've lived a long time, sir, and the longer I've lived, the more convincing proof I see of this truth God governs in the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it's probable that an empire, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? And he goes on to say, we are assured in the sacred writings that except the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain that build it. And this is the way he finishes his statement. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. Benjamin Franklin realized that the hand of God was on the formation of this nation, and apart from his help, that this nation would never be able to stand. Our politicians today have forgotten some of these truths or have intentionally ignored these truths. Many of our politicians today are scoffers at the things of God. They mock Christians. They make fun of us. They ignore us. They don't listen to God. And we have come to a time when lobbyists and special interest groups determine the policy for this country. Not the people. Many of the Americans in, this, in our country today, too, have turned their back on God. They worship the false gods of democracy or business or materialism. They worship the false gods of human ingenuity or talents or intellect. But we have moved away from God's standards. The standards as he talks about in this passage of Scripture, he says, I'm going to drop the plumb line right next to you. And here's the standards. Justice and righteousness. Those are God's standards. Justice and righteousness. Paul's words in... I started to preach from this passage today. But Paul's words in 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 5 describe our nation to a T. Listen to what it says. But know this, difficult times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self. Does that sound familiar to y'all? People want their 15 minutes of fame. They want to take their selfies and post them all over Facebook or wherever. People will be boastful, proud. And I, I can give y'all illustrations of each one of these if y'all want to stay here all afternoon. We can talk about that. But just think about it yourself. Lovers of self, 
lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Each one of these we could have a sermon on, couldn't we? Ungrateful. Have you ever been in a day and time when people are so ungrateful to all the blessings? I, I promise, I really think all these people that hate the United States that are so ungrateful, I think you just ought to send them overseas and let them live in one of these third world countries for a year. And then they can come back and I promise you they'll bend over and kiss the ground because of the freedoms that we enjoy. Unholy. Unloving. Irreconcilable. You know, it's a sad day to me that you can't even discuss your ideas openly anymore because if you use a reasoned argument, people will shout you down until you desist in what you're doing so that you come over to their way of thinking that they can't even prove and they don't even have any theological or philosophical foundations for what they how they believe what they believe. Slanderers without self-control. Probably I'll not go there with that one, huh? Brutal, without love for what is good. Traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Is that not an apt description of what we see taking place in our society today? That's the condition of the nation in which we find ourselves today. It scares me about my kids and my, the world my kids and my grandkids are going to grow up in. You know, I, I probably on the downhill slide of my life, and I know some of y'all are even further along in the process than I am, but our kids are going to have to grow up in a different world. They are growing up in a different world. And our, I can't even imagine how much the world's changed in the last 15 years, and the, especially here in this country. What's it going to look like for our grandkids when they get to be adults? And some of y'all have great grandkids. You know, I understand that. Same thing. Let's talk about what God's response is to the condition of the nation. Notice what he says. You know, for those who early in this chapter had refused to hear what God had to say, this is what God said. This is what Isaiah says. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You know, they didn't want to hear God's word, did they? But Isaiah was going to be faithful to his calling. And you and I need to stand up and, and continue to say, Thus saith the Lord, because only in the Lord is there rest. Only in God's word is there strength and rest that we need for our nation. What's God's answer to the leaders of Israel and to the leaders of this country? Your political alliances are hopeless. He says, I'm going to annul your covenant with death. I'm going to do away, wash away, or wipe away your refuge of lies. You know, when you don't believe the truth, where do you have to find your refuge? You find it in lies, don't you? God says, I'm going to wipe all that away. He says, hell will sweep away the refuge of your lives in verse 17. How does God answer the political leaders that if built this false foundation that's going to cause the nations to stumble. He says, I am the one. I, God, the Lord God, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion. A stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. That day and time, when they built a building, they didn't have all the tools and stuff that we've got nowadays. Tommy, I bet they would have killed for a bulldozer and one of those things back during that day and time. They didn't have any of that kind of stuff. But they would lay this cornerstone. And that's the way they knew if the building was square. They had to get a square block, square, square cornerstone. Most important stone in the building. And God said, I'm laying, I have laid, I have already laid. Notice this in past tense. I have laid a precious Cornerstone. God had already provided the nation with a solid basis for their security. If you think about it, a building stands or falls based on the solidness of the foundation. God had placed a precious cornerstone which provided a sure foundation. The nation did not need to look for help 
in, idol in these idolatrous nations. The people didn't need to fear what was coming. All they needed to do was to put their trust in God. Had God not really delivered all them from all their enemies? Had God not dispersed all the Canaanites from the land so that Israel could come in and take possession of that land. God had done all that for them, had He not? Could God not protect what He had given to them? Of course He could. And that's the point that God is trying to make. They didn't need to pay, place their faith in these idolatrous nations. They needed to put their faith in the power and the promises of God. And that was not to be something that was blind or an unknown faith. They had seen what God had done in their history. Just go back and read the book. It talks about how God had miraculously delivered them time and time again and put them where they were. Guys, the only hope for any nation is the trusted and tried foundation. The Bible and New Testament writers tell us very plainly who that trusted foundation is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's God. It's His truth. It's the Lord Jesus Christ that is the foundation for any nation but to enjoy that, we must live according to this book right here. That's why God says, I'm going to drop a plumb line of justice and righteousness beside the nation to find out if it measures up to my standards. Because these leaders had not trusted in righteousness and justice. Because the rich were getting richer at the expense of the poor. Because the poor ha had no really rights. They couldn't go to the court and get a fair hearing for their problems because the rich were in control of the courts. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Because of that, the building that they had constructed would not stand. It would fall justice or fairness or impartiality or objectivity, righteousness, which means right standing to God, or timeless standards by which God measures all peoples and all nations. A nation full of self-sufficiency, a nation full of scoffers and idolaters and liars, God is not going to stand by and let that kind of nation continue. Guys, we, we desperately need to consider God's holy standards anew. I'm going to get in trouble, okay? I'm, I'm going to quit preaching and go to meddling. So y'all just get mad at me right now and get over with it. But I feel like the Lord wants me to say this. What in the world would happen if we voted for politicians who stood for justice and righteousness, not based on which political party they were, they were part of? I get so sick of say, hearing people say, I, I grew up a Democrat and I'm always going to vote Democrat, or I grew up a Republican and I'm always going to vote Republican. What about voting for those people who have standards of justice and righteousness? If our nation is going to continue from this day forward, those must be the standards, guys. Go and look at the great nations in the, in the Bible. Look at the nation of Babylon. Look at the nation of Greece. Look at the nation of Rome. You know what happened to those guys? They crumble from within because they quit following the standards found in this book right here. Don't ever say it'll never happen to America because the first time you say something like that, you're telling God what God can do. And God answers to no, none of us, just so you know. Guys, we're in a critical time. And I'm so thankful to be a part of this country. It's just such a... I mean, if you've lived overseas like I have as a missionary, you understand what other people... I know why people are trying to break down the doors and the walls to get into this place. I understand that. Because I've lived in the other side. I've lived in a third world country. I know how hard it is and how families struggle even to be able to feed their families. I understand that. We live in a great country, but also know that God is not going to stand by and ignore people who blatantly scoff at who He is and who blatantly ignore His standards of righteousness and justice, who live in open and blatant sin and act like there's no problem with it when you, you and I no longer even blush at sin. Proverbs reminds us that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace from any people. 
I like the way that Isaiah describes the short-sightedness of these leaders. He refers to the fact that they were living on short beds and narrow sheets. You ever been on a short bed before? Brother Stan Waffler, I'm sure he's uh, in Africa. I'm sure he's had a problem sometime finding a short bed. Y'all know Brother Stan, he's about that tall, you know. I I've never had that problem, but, but there are people that have problems when your feet hang off the end of the bed. I've got a son-in-law who's 6'4", and he has problems sometimes, you know. You ever been in a short bed and had narrow sheets? You can't, you, Jonathan, I'll see you shaking your head. You know exactly what I'm talking about over there. And the arrow sheets, you ever had one of those blankets that just, I, we got this small blanket that my wife uses to cover up with sometime, and I try to cover up with that thing, and I can't get all myself inside that blanket because it's too short. It's too narrow. You see, man's plans will never ma measure up to the plans and to the teachings of the Word of God. Guys, we need to call our leaders in our country to start listening to God's standards, to start trying to get this country back to what God's book says. And if those leaders refuse, we, just, we need some different leaders. That's all I'm going to say. As late as the 1960s, the heights of the buildings in Seattle, Washington were restricted because of the fear of earthquakes. The tallest building was 36 stories. But that building was soon dwarfed. And the reason why is because engineers invented a system of vertical poles and cross beams that would withstand the shock of high magnitude earthquakes. Almost overnight, these big buildings of 50, 60, and 70 stories appeared on the scene. You know why? Because they had a sure foundation. That is sure foundation. The foundation makes all the difference. Just like the cornerstone that God has laid for any nation. The sure and foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah warned the people with hopes and thought processes, I'm sure, that really hoped and prayed that the nation would respond. Guess what? They continued to refuse to listen to God's word and God's prophet. In 722, the Assyrians literally wiped out the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom, and they never existed again as a nation ever. That's called God's judgment on that nation. The southern kingdom to which Isaiah is writing about in this passage of Scripture, you would have thought they would have learned the lesson after observing what happened to the northern kingdom, guess what? They just continued to ignore God and do their own thing. So in 586, they were destroyed and spent 70 years. Some of the people that went into bondage died in bondage. Many of the people who went back to Jerusalem after 70 years had been born in Babylon. They never lived in Jerusalem a day in their life. God brought judgment We live in a day and time when people are arrogant towards the things. We are intellectually prideful. We laugh at the simple message of the gospel. Guys, the only trusted and try, tried and true cornerstone is the Lord Jesus Christ. As you celebrate Independence Day, I hope and pray that you'll think about, go home and think about this message. Think about what can I do as a citizen of this country of course, whose primary citizenship is in heaven, we're first and foremost believers in Christ. But God has left us in this world so that we can make a difference, that, so that we can impact culture. And ask yourself, what can I do to make a difference so that this country will turn around and go in the direction that is pleasing unto God? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we humbly come into your presence today thankful for your many blessings that you've poured out on us but father we confess to you work our country's in trouble and we know that father we know that you're still on the throne that your standards of justice and righteousness are still standards today 
And Lord, we want to first of all ask your forgiveness because a lot of times as Christians, since our citizenship is in heaven, we've simply ignored what's going on in politics and we've ignored what's going on in our country and our world. And much of what we are experiencing now, we have allowed to happen because we haven't been vocal to speak up about you and your standards. Lord, forgive us. Give us courage and boldness to be the people you've called us to be. And Lord, I pray that and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned before in the beginning of this message, I know I've kind of been talking about our country as a whole, but God's standards of justice and righteousness are just as true for us as individuals as they are true for the nation. If you're here today and you already know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if God dropped a plumb line right beside you, a plumb line of justice and righteousness, how would you measure up? Have you gotten so far in sin that you've forgotten how to blush that you don't really know you've become so comfortable in your sin? You know, one of the biggest problems we face in this country is Christians don't look like Christians any longer. We look just like the rest of the people in the world and we've lost our influence because we live in open and blatant sin and don't even know how to blush anymore about it. If you've got an issue in your life that you need to deal with, today is the great time to deal with it. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you of something right now, you need to respond to that today. And so in a minute when we have a hymn of invitation, if there's a decision you need to make, maybe you need to rededicate your life. Maybe you need to come and become a part of this church where we serve the living God. We don't get it all right. We're not perfect. You know, I tell people all the time, the church is not a, a hotel for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. We all are sinners saved by grace. We're trying to do the right thing. We don't always get it right, but we try. We'd love to have you become a part of us, though, where we can grow together to be what God would have us to be. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, let me just, I, I, I don't know how to say this any, any clearer than this. There's going to come a day when this world comes to an end, when Jesus Christ comes back, if you look at the book of Revelation, all of us are going to be standing before God's throne. And the Bible says, first of all, God's going to open a book. That book is called the Lamb's Book of Life. Jesus is called the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Every person whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, God's going to welcome them into heaven. He's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come on in here and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Enjoy the place that I've prepared for you from all eternity. That'll be a great day, won't it? Won't that be exciting? But let me tell you the other part. For every person whose name is not round written in the Lamb's Book of Life, there's going to be some other books open. And it's called the Books of Works. More than one. I personally believe, and this is just my belief, you, I can't prove this from Scripture, so if you don't agree with me, that's okay, because this is not out of God's book. I personally believe one of those books is going to have your name on it. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God's going to open that book. It's going to have every thought that you've ever thought. It's going to have every word that you've ever spoken. It's going to have everything that you've ever done, both good and bad and otherwise. And God is going to drop a plumb line the standard of righteousness and justice and say, do you measure up to that? And since the Bible says there's nobody's righteousness except for the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that is given to us when we put our faith and trust in Him, that's the only thing that can get us into heaven. I promise you, your good works are not going to measure up to that. So if you think your good works are going to save you, it's not going to happen. The only thing that will save you is if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this invitation is for. Please come before it's too late, before the trumpet sounds, before God says it's too late and time is over with, before God calls you home, before death takes you, please put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you want to do that today, I'm going to stand right down here. Just come take my hand and say, Pastor, I want to invite Jesus Christ into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. I want to have my sins forgiven. I want to have the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ today. And I'll be happy to share with you what you need to do. Let's stand together and sing.